energy. His mother was a woman of character and tenderness. All who knew her called her Mama Margaret. Fathomless was the love she showed her sons, not in coddling words, but in deeds. And she is now uh, a venerable, which means that she's at the first step of being canonized a saint. One time, walking with his mother in the street, he said, uh, hello, father, to the, to the priest. And he started crying because he wasn't acknowledged by the priest uh, who just bowed his head. Deeply hurt, he complained that the priest hurt his feelings. And he said, when I grow up, he told his astonished mother, I'm going to be a priest and I'll talk to children all the time and I'll do everything for them. Habibi. Once with a battered cheek or torn shirt, an explanation, he came to his mother and, his mo and he said, but mama, those boys aren't really bad. They just don't have a good mother like I have. And they don't know their catechism and their parents don't take, take them to church. When I'm with them, they behave better. Please, mama, may I go with them? He learned the tricks of magic from traveling showmen. He juggled, he walked the tightrope, uh, and then he opened his own carnival show. Uh, admission was one rosary to be recited by all the spectators, uh, and he would basically repeat the Sunday homily uh, to everybody there. Early vocation. When John was nine, the master called him openly. A mission as important as this could not be left to mere urge. In a dream, John found himself fighting a large crowd of rowdy lads who were cursing and carrying on abominably. He, he tried to stop them, but they refused to listen to him. Suddenly, a man appeared who motioned to John and said, Not with punches will you help these boys, but with goodness and kindness. He said, Who are you? gasped the astonished boy. Then a woman appeared, putting her arms around him, and said, Watch what I do, John. John looked. The boys changed to a pack of snarling wild animals whose growls sent terror into his heart. Then the woman put out her hand. The beast changed again to a frockling flock of lambs. But what does it all mean? I'm just a farm boy. What can I do? He burst into tears. Then placed her hand. Then she placed her hand on, on his head and said, In due time, everything will be clear to you. This is the field of your work. Be humble, steadfast, and strong. John knew his vocation, but the priesthood meant studies, and there was no money on the Bosco farm. Margaret Bosco divided the paltry estate left by her husband and allowed her young son to go to this school, this public school, and board with a good family she knew. Alone in the town, John soon learned the hardships of an orphan's life. He worked after school to support himself. Though he was only 15, he labored in a blacksmith shop, then as a tailor, a waiter, a pin boy, and in a bowling alley, a shoemaker, anything to get few pennies to ease his mother's burden. I'm going to be a priest, he told his friends. I'm going to give my life to the care of boys. By 1835, when John was 20, he was ready for the seminary, taking with him an inevitable record for excellence in studies, a reputation for solid piety, and friendship of countless people in many walks of life. Prominent amongst them was a young priest, Father Cafasso, now St. Joseph Cafasso. So this confessor, Joseph's confessor, became a saint who best understood him and helped him to interpret God's plan. On June 5th, 1841, John was ordained to the priesthood in Turin. While vesting for Mass, the priest heard the sacristan shrieking at a young boy who had sneaked into the church to get warm. Here, call the boy back, cried Don, Domin cried Don Bosco. He's my friend. The boy came over to Don Bosco after getting to know him for a few minutes. A friendship struck upon the spur of the moment. Began John Bosco's worldwide, worldwide ministry to bring young people to God. He told Bartholomew to stay for Mass. After Don Bosco told the boy, next Sunday, bring your friends here and we'll spend the day together. The next Sunday, four ragged boys looking badly in need of a meal and warm clothing came to John Bosco. They were certainly in very dire spiritual need, and their number multiplied in a few weeks, so that caring for them soon became a major problem. In the 1840s, the slums of Turin were overrun by the poverty that assaulted inevitably from sweatshop factories with their hazardous machinery, child labor, and starvation wages. 
Walking through these slums, Don Bosco came face to face with his mission. As he visited the prisons with Father Cafaso, the conviction of his vocation seemed to shout with him. These boys are not bad. Take care of them before they fall into crime. That is your task. With his heart full of trust in his lady, Mary, and his pockets empty, Don Bosco courageously took up the work. From then on, it was only, give me souls, the souls of young people. Don Bosco called him weekly, band, called, called his weekly band of ragged young people the oratory. The oratory is a place of prayer. That's, that's where you, it's, a, it's a, a gathering space of prayer. A term which to his mind suggested prayer and organized recreation. In the beginning, it was a floating thing, its membership growing daily in large proportions. Every Sunday, they would meet in a different place, a city, church, a cemetery, chapel, or an empty lot. Don Bosco would hear their confessions and say mass for them. An hour of religious instruction would follow, plain, simple talks coming from the heart and embodying the solid truths of the faith. Then the priest would take his band of ragged boys into the country for an all-day outing of games. A final walk, a final talk would close the oratory day, and the tired bunch would trail into Turin, scattering to their homes along the way. One stormy night in 1850, as Don Bosco and his mother were still awake and working, a timid knock came at their door. As Mama Margaret opened it, there stood a tiny, dripping, wet, scared, starved, blinking in the light. A little boy. Please, he whined, I'm hungry, can I come in? As he devoured a bowl of steaming soup, he told his story. His mother had just died, and he was alone in the world. He'll stay with us, Don Bosco stated. But where will he sleep, Mama Margaret asked. If ne necessary, we'll sling a basket from the ceiling for a bed, laughed the priest. The boy laughed too. He was Don Bosco's first orphan. How many of us, I just, I always think to, the, to myself, how many of us have room to spare in our homes and maybe God might be calling us to take in somebody. I've thought about that. I've thought about that so many times. Like, we've got so much space in our homes, and there are so many people who have nowhere to sleep. And I'm not saying we need to, like, go down into Detroit and just, like, drive around and be like, hey, want to come sleep over? But, I mean, obviously that's not the case. But I do believe that God might be calling us to be more generous, to be more open with those who are in need. But sometimes we're just too self-consumed. Or we're afraid. We should ask John Bosco to get, open our eyes a little bit to see where God might be calling us. More orphans came. Don Bosco brought the house adjoining the shed. He bought the house uh, adjoining the shed. The boarders used to go to work or school in turn each day returning home to Don Bosco and Mama Margaret for meals. But Don Bosco soon realized that his makeshift system had too many drawbacks and that he had to have a school of his own. One day in 1853, he took a corner of Mama Margaret's kitchen and converted it into a cobbler shop. The tiny hallway became a carpenter shop. And the teachers, Don Bosco himself, and two hired men. Today, the congregation of John Bosco operates professional training centers and college preparatory schools throughout the world, both in highly developed countries and in many undeveloped countries. It was actually a liberal-minded politician who had closed convent doors who first suggested the idea of a new religious congregation or a religious order to John Bosco. He said, start a new order, and, and, and he says, and then John Bosco says to him, so start a new order and have you suppress it in its cradle? He said, no, your case is different. Your work for the poor, your schools really belong to the working class. No one will resent what you do. Make sure your religious keep their status as citizens, and we won't touch you. His own boys were the best material. On the night of December 18, 1859, was born the congregation of St. Francis de Sales, properly, popularly known today as the Salesians of Don Bosco, and officially titled the Society of St. Francis de Sales. In 1869, the congregation was approved, and five years later, so were his constitutions. Today, Salesian priests and brothers, bound by one rule, inspired by the same spirit of their founder, are all dedica dedicated to the double task of self-sanctification and the care for the youth. Today, the Salesians number over 15,700 brothers and priests. Wow. He also began a branch of women religious. In 1875, he received their first vows. 
He called them daughters of Mary, help of Christians. He attributed this work ultimately to Our Lady. Today, there are more than 16,000 Salesian sisters. Wow. He says this, listen, there are two things the devil is deathly afraid of, fervent communions and frequent visits to the Blessed Sacrament. Do you want our Lord to grant you many graces? Visit him often. Do you want him to grant you only a few? Visit him only seldom. Do you want the devil to flee from you? Visit Jesus often. Do you want to overcome the devil? Take refuge at Jesus' feet. Visiting the Blessed Sacrament is essential, my dear, boy, my dear boys, if you want to overcome the devil. Therefore, make frequent visits to Jesus. If you do that, the devil will never prevail against you. Oftentimes, and I've said this before, and I think it's important for us to remember, that God will allow us to feel helpless because he's trying to bid us to come to him. But not just to pray, not just to say words like in my mind. Oftentimes we can say prayers. Sometimes God wants you to get so weak that you have no choice but to come visit him. That's what Jesus wants. Jesus wants you to come visit him. Jesus wants you to come visit him not seldom. He wants you to come visit him often. And so it's very simple. Do we want many graces? We go to him often. We want fewer graces? We go to him less. We go to him seldom. First, tell the devil to rest, and then I'll rest too, he said. Don Bosco used to say those words who urged him to let up his activity. For many years, he slept only five hours a night, skipping a night each week. After a day of physical work, he would spend the quiet hours of the night pining letters to friends for aid, sending letters to comfort those who begged for his prayers, and writing books on mathematics, literature, the Bible, and the church history for boys. I don't even know what one plus one is. It seems to me that the, so he has this dream. He had about 40 dreams that are, that are actually recorded. And he has this dream, and this is what he says in this dream. It seems to me that the Pope's ship might mean the church, of which he is the head, the ships, men, the sea, this world. Those who defend the big ships are the good, lovingly attached to the Holy See, which is the Vatican, or the church. The others are her enemies who try with every kind of weapon to annihilate her. The two columns of salvation seem to be devotion to Mary, most, most holy, and to the blessed sacrament, the Eucharist. The enemy's ships are persecutions. The most serious trials for the church are near at hand. That which had been so far is almost nothing in the face of that which must befall. Her enemies are represented by the ships that try to sink the principal ship if they could. Only two means are left to save her amidst. So much, so much confusion. Devotion to Mary Most Holy and frequent communion. Making use of every means and doing our best to practice them and having them practice everywhere and by everybody. Do you see in the picture? The two columns of salvation. And he does note that, of course, the column of the Eucharist is higher because Christ is God. Christ is higher than Our Lady. But these two are the columns of the protection of our church. And how we protect our Catholic Church is by us, by doing what we can do, right? By coming to the Eucharist, right? And by having a devotion to Mary. Is that enough for just the priest to do that? Everybody needs to do that so that we as a church can be protected by the persecutions that come. Our church is persecuted, and it says very clear that what he was seeing was nothing in comparison to what was to befall, what was to come. And we see now even more and more every day that our persecutions are getting greater and greater, and they will become greater. And that's a very scary thing. Uh, I, to scare you even more, Saint, uh, I, I call him a saint, but he's not a saint, of course. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, who's still alive, and I believe he's a saint, he said that one day the church will be so little... So many people will leave the Catholic Church because of persecution. The church will be a small number before Jesus comes back. Because so many people will fall away. They will not be able to handle the persecution. So does that want to be us? Do, do, do we want to be that? Does, is that and, and whenever I think about that, I'm like, is that going to be me? God, give me the grace that that will never be me. Right? That I will, I will go to death for the sake of, of never, ever refusing Christ and his church too. 
his blessing carried astonishing powers. Sometimes he was seen rising in ecstasy during the Mass. Another one who floats. <laughs> but with the characteristic humil humility, he labored to feed his ministry with prayer. So much so that Pope Pius IX said of him that he prayed every moment of his life. In 1867, a poor woman introduced herself to Don Bosco, advanced in years, crippled. She dragged herself with the help of two crutches. She asked Don Bosco, have pity on me too, give me a blessing. And Don Bosco said, kneel. But she answered, I cannot, my legs are almost dead. It had been so long since I had been able to kneel. Don Bosco insisted, it does not matter, kneel. And the woman leaned on her crutches and tried to bend down to the ground. The holy man removed her crutches from under her arms and threw them on her shoulders in front of hundreds of people who were watching in silence, and they all applauded. The woman knelt, weeping with joy, knowing that she had been healed. She asked how she could thank John Bosco, and the saint replied, Say with me three Hail Marys to Our Lady of Help of Christians, who tells of this event, is a witness, well qualified, present during that event. The time came when Grigio would prove his worth. So he had this dog who would just randomly appear, okay, and he would disappear. And uh, Don Bosco explains that uh, on the, around the end of November of 1854, one dark, rainy night, I was returning home from the city. At a certain point, I realized that two men were walking a short distance in front of me. When I quickened my steps, they quickened theirs. And when I slowed down, they slowed down. I then tried to retrace my steps, but it was too late. Suddenly, taking two leaps towards me, they quietly threw a dark cloak over my face. I struggled to free myself, but it was useless. One trying to gag me, I tried to shout, but in vain. Suddenly, there was a terrific howl. Grigio appeared and leaped on the man holding the cloak, forcing him to let go. He then bit the second one and brought him to the muddy ground. When the first man tried to escape, Grigio went after him and likewise rolled him to the mud. He stood over him, growling ferociously. Call off your dog, they shouted. shouted. Call off your dog. I call, I'll call him off if you only allow me to go away in peace. Yes, yes, they said, but call him off. As soon as John Bosco said, come, Grigio, the dog obediently trotted over and walked the remainder of the way with him. And one time, I'll, I'll add this, that he was in the house and he was about to leave, and uh, the dog would not allow him to leave the house. And so his mother looked at him and said, if you're not going to listen to me, listen to the dog. He's smarter than you. He was basically trying to say, listen to the dog. He's trying to protect you. Don't leave the house. And he didn't leave the house. But dogs are sweet. I have a dog now. I love him. My mom's, it's like growing on my mom. Because I basically got the dog and then like left it at my parents' house and they hate me for it secretly. But it's okay. They're going to love him in time. He's the cutest little thing. His name is Toby. He probably cannot protect me, but that's okay. I still love him. He's not even 20 pounds either. He's so cute. I should show you guys a picture. Anyway. See, Mom? Like, St. John Bosco had a dog. You know? Yeah, she hates me right now. It's okay. <laughs> He said this. He said, you should insistently ask for three graces. Everyone absolutely is in need of these, but most especially for the young. He said, the first is never to commit mortal sin during your life. And he would say, I want you to implore this grace through Mary's intercession at any cost, because without this, any other grace would be of little avail. Do you know what it means to fall into mortal sin? It means refusing to be children of God and becoming children of Satan. The second grace that you should ask for is to persevere the holy and precious virtue of purity. If you keep guard over such a beautiful virtue, you will be very, you will be very like the angels in heaven. And your guardian angel will, gu will guard you, regard you as his brother, since he will enjoy your company so much. The third grace, that will also be a very great help of you in persevering the virtue of purity. It is the grace of running away from bad companions. How happy will you be, my dear boys, if you flee from the company of the wicked? By doing this, you will be sure of taking the road to paradise. Otherwise, you run the grave risk of being lost for eternity. Therefore, when you hear your friends swearing, 
blaspheming or putting down religion or trying to draw away you from the try, trying to draw you away from the church or worse still speaking in a language that is contrary to the virtue of modesty keep away from them like the plague basically treat them like coronavirus and be sure that the purer is your gaze your speech the more pleased Mary will be with you and the more graces she will obtain from you from her son our redeemer Jesus Christ how many of us have friends that we know are doing those very things. Gossiping, swearing, talking bad about the church, leading us to feel some type of way when we're with them. Right? Many of us, and I, I hear this all the time in confession, Father, you know, I didn't defend the church when people were talking about the church. You know, I, 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 I just kind of like stayed silent then you shouldn't be friends with these people because if you don't have the grace and you're not, you're not strong in your faith to be able to, to, to have some sort of influence, a positive influence on them, then clearly they're having a bad influence on you. And so even these friends that to you may seem like not a big deal are a big deal. So St. John Bosco is saying, I mean, and we all know this, that your friends are who you become. You become who your friends are. And I think we take that lightly. We always say that for kids, but we don't take it even for ourselves. So even more so, how much more for children who are so easily influenced, who don't have a strong root of identity. They're looking for identity. They're looking for acceptance. And anybody in that moment is going to accept them, they're going to go with. Right? So who are our friends? And who are our children's friends? Right? How to correct children. This is important. He says, never as far as possible correct in public, but in private apart from others. How many of us are so quick to correct a child in public in front of other people, destroying his self-esteem? I mean, a child's self-esteem is one of the most important components to a child's development. And all of us, really. I mean, we all struggle with self-esteem and to be honest with you the reason why we struggle with self-esteem is because somebody embarrassed us or somebody corrected us or somebody pointed out our fault at, at a very young age and destroyed our confidence hurt our confidence and unfortunately that is inevitable but as as a parent or 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 a figure that is a, like a teaching figure a, an older brother a sister we need to keep this in mind right be careful how you address, how you correct. Many times, an indirect method of, method of correcting is useful. For example, while in the presence of one at fault, speak to another about the folly of those who do lose their self-respect and good sense, so deserve punishment. So instead of speaking directly to that person about what they did, speak to another person in their, in their presence about why that's wrong and how that's wrong. Because when you're speaking directly to someone, anybody, what's going to happen is they're going to get defensive. We all get defensive. Right? But most especially a child will become defensive. They'll think that you're attacking them. And all of us can have that struggle of like, hey, you know, you got chocolate on your shirt. No, I don't. Well, no, look at your shirt. You got chocolate on your shirt. It's like, and then it, it basically like you told that person they're going to hell, right? It's like, all I did was tell you that, you know, you have some chocolate on your shirt, right? And even more so, we're in a very, very, very sensitive age where you can't say anything to anybody anymore. So this could be very helpful. He says this, wait until the child is calm. Never correct a boy while he is still under the influence of his own temper. But I think this, this really, truly, I mean, this works for all of us, right? In the midst of, of anger or frustration or reacting, you never get anywhere, right? A correction given at that time would only serve to embitter him and make things worse. Give him time to reflect, to enter into himself he will realize that he is wrong. Uh, uh, one of the things that I, I tell couples all the time in, um, sometimes couples will come for, uh, you know, just marriage problems, and, and I'll say like, you know, you know that he has a temper. Yeah, I do. Okay, so you know that he needs a moment to walk away. Yeah, I do. Okay, do you give him that moment? No, I don't. Okay, and you're wondering why your husband hates you, <laughs> right? Some people just need a moment. 
right? Like some people, and I think we all do, whether you're that type of person that wants to figure it out on the spot or you need two, three days to think about it and then figure it out, we all need a moment to come back to our senses because we all have emotions and emotions can be a bad thing sometimes and we can react very quickly. And so in those moments, we need a moment. And if we see somebody frustrated, we are doing a disservice by badgering that person. Walk away. Give that person a second. Even if they're wrong, give them a second, right? Sweeten, he says, sweeten correction with comfort. Correction at times brings about anxiety and fear. A word of comfort can easily offset this. A person who forgets and helps the sulprit to forget is a true educator. How to discipline. The basic reason why young people get in trouble is youthful fickleness, which in a moment can forget the rules of discipline and the punishments they threaten. Fickleness means one minute you're like this, the next minute you're like this. To be honest with you, we're all fickle, okay? Give them, he says, give them ample liber liberty to jump, run, make a den as much as they please. Gymnastics, music, declamation of poems, theatricals, hikes are very effective, effective methods for getting discipline. They favor good living and good health. And boys should not only be loved, but realize that they are loved. I love that. Boys should not only be loved, but they must realize that they are loved. Children will know that they are loved by being loved in the things that they like, by sharing in their youthful interests. Let teachers like what pleases the youngsters, and the youngsters will come to like what pleases the superiors. In this way, their work will be made easy. He says this about punishment. Punishment should be your last resort. In my long career as an educator, how often this has been brought home to me. No doubt it is ten times easier to lose our patience than to control it to threaten a boy than to persuade him. No doubt, too, it is much more gratifying to our pride to punish those who resist us than to bear them with firm kindness. It is so difficult to be kind to a person in those moments where they are acting like fools, right? Anybody, not just a child, not just a youth, but anybody. But oftentimes, we think that if we can react or we can punish them in some, some type of way that somehow, some way I'm going to teach them. And it never really works, does it? And only adds more fuel to the fire. He says this. Punish, and actually, this is what was said about his way, his, his kind of, uh, his method. Punishment was not to be inflicted unless inevitable. Only when every other means was exhausted. And then when there was no hope to draw some advantage. He says this. So he didn't really like physical punishment. Um, he was very much against physical punishment. He says this, to strike a boy in any way, to make him kneel in a painful position, to pull his ears, and any other similar, similar punishments must be absolutely avoided because the laws forbid them. They greatly irritate the student and degrade the educator. Don Bosco preferred above all natural and, and psychological punishments that were motivated by reasonableness and goodness. The withholding of some token of kindness is a punishment which stimulates emulation, gives courage, and never degrades. So withholding some sort of token, right, or some sort of goodness is better than you slapping a child. Or better yet, you freaking out. I mean, to be honest with you, I think that the, the same, it's the same thing with anybody. That whether you're physically hitting a person or you're hitting a person with your words, it, it, it just does not accomplish anything. With the young, punishment is whatever is meant as a punishment. It has been noticed that in the case of some boys, a reproachful look is more effective than a slap in the face would be. Praise of work, well done, and a blame in the case of carelessness are already a reward of, or punishment. Kids need to be uplifted at all times. At all times, kids need to know that there's goodness in them. We all need to know that there's goodness in us. Unfortunately, kind of the older that we become, the, 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 the more difficult it is for those truths to be instilled in us. So at a young age, if your child doesn't believe in their own goodness or your teens don't believe in their own goodness and they cannot see it, then in 40 years, no matter what you say to them, they will not see it. 
no matter how beautiful, no matter how rich, no matter what is that you do, you, it, it's almost impossible at that point until the grace of God enters that person's soul, until that person meets Jesus and Jesus shows them the goodness that's inside of them. I think we all need that. In 1855, Don Bosco taught a complete catechism course for all and held a three-day course of Lenten spiritual exercises for, uh, for some juveniles, basically. He spoke to the prison chief warder, proposing them to take an all-day outing. No one will run away. I will give you my word for it. My only condition is that no police protect us, and I want your word of honor. I take the entire risk. If anyone runs away, you will jail me. So the ward's like, okay, all right, I'm going to you take your word for it. I will put you in jail. He was very, very serious. If all of those inmates do not come back, you're going to jail. And he says this, Don Bosco, please come. They, they laughed together, and, and the Ratazzi became serious. Don Bosco, please come down to earth. Without police, you will not bring a single one back. And he says, and I will tell you, I will bring the lot. I will bring the lot. Let's bet. I have given my word of honor, and he, this is him speaking to the kids. I have given my word of honor that from first to last, you will behave and you will not attempt to escape. The minister has given me his word that he will not send any police in uniform or plain clothes. Now you have to give me your word. If only one escapes, I will be dishonored. They will not allow me to set foot here again. Can I trust you? The boys, the boys confab, then the oldest spoke. We give you our word, we shall all come back and shall behave. So he celebrated mass for them, they played games, took them along the, the river. Uh, after late afternoon snack, they returned. The boys urged Don Bosco, rather tired, to ride the unloaded donkey. They led it by the brittle and singing and laughing arrived at the prison. The warder at once counted them. They were all there. It was a sad farewell to the prison gate. Don Bosco said goodbye to each one. He went home heavy-hearted for having given them no more than one day of freedom. We all need to be trusted. And even more so, a youth needs to be given the opportunity to be trusted. We have to be prepared that oftentimes when somebody does trust us with something, or we trust a youth with something, that we will fail. A couple times we will fail. But in the end, the more we continue to give that person an opportunity to prove their trustfulness and their worthiness, then they begin to believe it. Dominic Savio, the life of Dominic Savio. April 2nd, 1842, in the village of Riva, two miles from the town of Chieri, in the province of Podmont, northern Italy, Dominic Savio was born. He was the second of 11 children born to Charles and Bridget Savio, who were poor, hardworking, pious people. Charles was a blacksmith. Dominic had remarkable control over his emotions. And while he could get angry like any of his companions, he was able to control himself in most any situation. He was friendly and showed early his leadership qualities and a strong sense of duty. He was a prayerful person and had an ever-maturing spirituality. At the, at the day of his first communion, drew near, or as it drew near, Dominic wrote down four resolutions, remarkably, mature thoughts for a seven-year-old. This is what he says. I will go to con confession and communion as often as my confessor will allow. I will sanctify Sundays and holy days in a special way. Jesus and Mary will be my friends. Death, but not sin. At seven years old. Death, but not sin. He traveled 12 miles to and from school every day for a whole school year. On one very hot day, an elderly man met him and asked, Aren't you afraid to walk so far alone on this country road? I'm not alone, replied Dominic. I have my guardian angel with me. But surely you find the journey long and tiresome in this very hot weather. He said, I work for a master who pays well. Who is your master? God is my master. Dominic, a young student, once a classmate committed a serious offense. This boy had a reputation for misbehavior. The student falsely accused Dominic of the offense. The teacher scolded the class and threatened Dominic uh, with, with expulsion. But because Dominic had never been, 
never misbeha misbehaved before, he gave Dominic severe scolding before the whole class. Dominic made no reply, but stood in silence, had bowed. A few days later, the boy who was actually guilty was discovered. Regretting his previous harsh words, the teacher asked Dominic why he not defended himself. He answered, his answer came slowly but simply. I knew that the older other boy was in trouble for other things. I remembered how our Lord had been unjustly accused, and I hoped that if I kept silent, he would be given another chance. Yeah. This little boy makes me emotional. I don't know why. At a, at a young age, he's trying to defend a little kid who was about to get him expelled. What is that reaction to the littlest thing that somebody says about me or does to me? They didn't invite me. They looked at me weird. They didn't text me. They said something in front of other people. And we create World War III. Whereas this little boy was willing to stay silent for the sake of this boy to have another chance. To me, I would have been like, Are you kidding me? Right? Like, who the heck do you think you are? Like, I didn't do it. I'm just defending myself, right? I, what, what was wrong with him being able to defend himself? There is nothing wrong with him defending himself. But God will oftentimes allow these saints to do the very opposite of what we do to show how extreme our sinfulness is. So sometimes God will allow the saints to become so extreme in the opposite manner, to show us, to wake us up, to make us realize how petty and how prideful and how stupid we really are sometimes when it comes to our neighbor. In 1854, Dominic and his father went looking for Don Bosco, who was going to be in the town of Marial Marialdo on the outing. After a brief introduction, Dominic asks, without hesitation, Dominic asks, Father, Will you take me to turn with you to the oratory to study? Well, you look like good material to me, Don Bosco exclaimed. Good material, Father? Good for what? To make a beautiful garment for the Lord, son. That's what he told him. To make a beautiful garment for the Lord, son. And then he said to him, Then take me with you, Father. You can be the tailor and I'll be the cloth. Make me into a beautiful garment for our Lord. <laughs> Your father and I have spoken and he agrees that you may come to Turin. From now on, you are one of the oratory boys. Let's pray for each other. Overjoyed and grateful beyond words, Dominic took Bosco's hand and said, Don Bosco, I will do my best. Dominic arrived in Turin at, at the oratory of St. Francis de Sales in early 1854. He was 12 and a half years old. He was always aware of what the others were doing, and he became the mentor for his companions. The other kids respected him and appreciated his leadership, but when things went wrong, he was not afraid to step in and to bring order to difficult situations. On one occasion, two boys had gotten into an argument and challenged one another to a rock duel, where they would throw rocks at each other. It seems that one of the boys insulted the family of the, family of the other. The two boys became enraged, and uh, with the way that they could think of settling things was to fight stones with each other. They were to meet uh, in the lot about 10 minutes walk from the oratory. Dominic uh, found out about this and he ran to them. And he jumps in the middle and he says, you must stop this. It is not right. You can't stop us, he says, he says to him. And then he says, not until I split his head open, the other added. I'm not stopping the fight, shot, shot back Dominic, but I'm asking you to accept on one condition. And what's that, they asked. But now they had arrived at the field, set up, and they set up the duel. Each boy stood facing the other with a distance of about 20 feet between him. Each had a pile of stones arranged at his feet. On the sing and the signal, they would begin throwing the stones at each other. And sometimes the kids would become so hurt that they'd end up with concussions and they would die. So this is like, this was a practice in the streets at that, that time. He says to them, Dominic, what are you doing? He says, do you promise you will fight under one condition that I set up? Yes, now get out of the way, agreed one of the boys. The other shouted, let's get this over with. What's the condition? Taking out a small crucifix, which he used to wear around his neck, Dominic held it up. Before you start the fight, you must look at this crucifix and throw the first stone at me. 
He strode before the angrier boy, and kneeling down, he said, You start. Throw the first stone at me. Taken by surprise, the boy began to tremble. No, he protested. I never had an argument with you, Dominic. Dominic ran over to the boy. He too was astonished and sure Dominic he was his friend and that he meant no harm. Then Dominic stood up, looking at them, and he said with great emotion, Neither of you is ready to hurt me because I am your friend. Yet you want to commit this sin over a stupid remark made at school? Christ, who was innocent, died for us rather than seek revenge from those who hated him. Dominic stood silent with the crucifix in his hand. Both boys dropped their stones, ashamed before his courageous stand. At that moment, one of them later admitted, all my determination broke down and a cold chill ran through me. I hated myself for having forced a good friend like Dominic to go to such lengths to keep us from sin. To show my regret, I forgave the boy who insulted me and asked Dominic to tell me of some good, some good priest who would hear my confession. Wow. Why do we hold grudges? Why in, in, in God's name do we hold grudges? Like if you really think about I don't care what you can come up with right now. I don't care what it is. I don't care how bad it is that you can come up with. At the end of the day, there really is no good excuse trying to explain to God why this person should not be forgiven and why you have the right to hold on to what this person has done. Right? So forgiveness is very simple. Forgiveness is what sets us free. If anything, when we don't forgive, we keep ourselves in a bondage. We become slaves to our, to our lack of forgiveness. He was devoted, very, very devoted to Mary. Dominic had a very special love for the Immaculate Heart of Mary. He prayed, asking for the grace of keeping his heart like Mary's, free from every impure desire. Mary, he would pray, I always want to be your son. Let me die rather than commit a single sin against chastity. Every Friday, he found, a, he, he found a few minutes during recreation, when all the kids were playing during recess, to go to the chapel with some friends and recite the seven sorrows of Mary or the litany of the sorrowful virgin. One Saturday, for example, he invited a companion to recite Our Lady's Vespers with him, the evening prayers of Mary. But the lad tried to get out of it by pleading that his hands were cold. Dominic took off his own gloves and gave them to him. Another time, he lent his coat to a boy to give him to go to church with him for a few minutes. About 10 months before his death, Dominic confided to Don Bosco, Father, I desire to do something for Mary, but I must do it at once. I want to share my love for the Blessed Virgin, but with my, compa with my companions, what can I do? Together, they agreed to start a group of students interested in promoting devotion to Mary, the Immaculate Mother of Jesus, and the good of the oratory. He drew up a few rules and guidelines for the group, which he called Sodality of the Immaculate Conception. On June 8, 1856, nine months before his death, Dominic had the rules approved by John Bosco, and the very first members were enrolled. Have you guys heard of like a Achawiya? Like, have the young people, so we don't know what a sodality is. It's, it's very much common for our, like, our parents and, and our grandparents' age. But a sodality is a group of people who get together, um, and, and they recite prayers together, and it's kind of like a spiritual group where they encourage each other, and there are, like, rules and, and things that they have to follow, kind of being a part of this confraternity. So he began something, only at 14 years old. Be devoted to Mary most holy, John Bosco says. Frequently call on her. Never was it known that anyone who trustingly had recourse to her was not promptly heard. So with devotion to Mary, and I know that this is a, kind of a difficult thing for a lot of people. A lot of people struggle with having a devotion to Mary. And it can almost sometimes feel like forced. Like I just don't get it. Like, okay, I love God. I worship God. Why do I need Mary? Why do I need to call on Mary? Right? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. And I will sum it up in, in, in just one concept. And this is what it always comes down to for me. Don't you need a mother? Don't you all have a mother? So to ask why I need Mary is to say, why do I need a mother? 
So it's not about coming up with reasons to have a devotion to Mary. This is not what we're talking about. This is about calling upon your mother throughout your day. Trusting that Mary is a mother. That when Mary stood at the cross, she saw each and every soul, and she willingly offered up the death of her son for each and every one of us. She was not angry at us. She was not resentful at us. She did it willingly because she wanted to become our mother in that moment. That when Jesus says to her, behold your son, and then he says to her, John, behold your mother, it's in that moment that Jesus is saying, I want you to have my mother too. It's very simple. That's what it always comes down to. So don't turn Mary into this, like, systematic thing. She's not, she, she's not a, a rule. She's not a, a, a thing. She's a mother. That's what it comes down to. So we should be calling upon her all throughout our day. Sometimes I'll just say the name of Mary. Sometimes I'll just say half of the Hail Mary. I'll just say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for me right now. Right? I'll just, I'll just call upon her throughout our day, just like a child will call upon its mother all throughout the day. Call upon Mary. Don't be afraid. Dominic Savio had extraordinary gifts. One night, after all had gone to bed, Dominic rushed into Don Bosco's room, waking him up. Don Bosco, come with me. What, he asked. Please, Don Bosco, hurry. With Dominic's insistence, Dominic, er, Don Bosco dressed quickly and followed him. They left the oratory, hurried down one street, and they, get to, uh, they go up these stairs and they get to a door. And he says, John, uh, Dominic Savio says to him, here. The door of the apartment opened, and a woman stood before Don Bosco. Thank God, cried the woman. There's little time. My husband is dying. He left the church, but now he wants to die a good Catholic. The man made his peace with God. Don Bosco heard his, con his confession and blessed him. The man died a few moments later. Days later, Don Bosco asked Dominic how he knew about that dying man. His face clouded over with a look of distress, and tears came to his eyes. Don Bosco did not insist. He just, he's like, I'm not even going to go there, right? I ain't got nothing to do with me. It's the Lord's work, right? Innocence of life, wrote Don Bosco, love of God and the desire of heaven had so elevated his soul that he had been said to be living with God, always absorbed in God. I'm 32 years old and I feel like I'm going to hell tomorrow, right? 14 years old and he's... Oh, Lord. Make the saints. Amen? Amen. Okay. Dominic's sister, Teresa, testified on the morning of September 12, 1856, Dominic rushed into John Bosco's room. Please, Father, he asked, may I go home? He said, why? My mother is very sick and Our Lady wants to care for her. Bosco asked if someone told him, but he replied, no one. I just know the same. So Dominic ran home. He goes to see his mother and... Um, and she says, Dominic, what are you doing here? He said, I found out that you were sick and I came to see you. Forcing herself to sit up, she replied, oh, it's nothing. Go downstairs. I'll see you later. I'll go, Mama, but first I want to hug you. He quickly embraced his mother and kissed her. Then he left the house and returned immediately. By the way, she was in, uh, in the midst of giving birth. She was in labor. A few minutes later, Bridget's labor pains reached their climax and subsided. It was at 5 at the evening that Dominic's baby sister Catherine was born. By the time Charles returned with the doctor, the birth was over. The woman who assisted Mr. Savio, Mrs. Savio noticed that she was wearing a green scapular. Do you guys know what the scapular is? The thob al -avra? Not having seen it before, they asked where she got it. She too was surprised, but then she replied, Dominic must have put the scapular on me as he embraced me because I've never had one like this before. That's why I had been safely delivered. On his return to the oratory, the only answer Dominic gave to John Bosco was, my mother is all right. I gave her a scapular of our blessed mother. He later on said that it was revealed to him that his mother was going to die. And so to save her, his mother from dying, he went to put the scapular on her. Habibi, <laughs> I love this little boy. <laughs> Since Dominic began showing signs of failing health, Don Bosco called in several doctors. The general opinion today is that Dominic was suffering from a respiratory infection. We should remember that in the mid-19th century, childhood death was very common. Respiratory diseases were not well understood. Why are you so sorry to go home, Don Bosco said. You should be glad to be with your parents again. 
I want to end my days at the oratory, he replied. You will go home for a while, and then you are better, and you can come back. No, Don Bosco, I'll go, but I'll never come back. Don, Dominic then walked out of the oratory gate with his father. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon of March 1st, after three years of living at the oratory. For the first four days at home, Dominic did well. Then he took a turn for the worse. He became weaker, his appetite failed, and his cough became more persistent. After the doctor left, he asked for the sacrament of anointing of the sick. To please his parents, he agreed on being anointed. He prayed, my God, forgive me my sins. I love you and I want to love you forever. Dominic's mind was so clear and his voice so loud that all the thoughts, all his thoughts were fine and on his way to recovery. He had been bled 10 times and he was very weak. They actually thought he was going to recover. He then fell asleep and rested for a half an hour. He then opened his eyes, looked at his parents, and gasped, Papa, it's time. Take my prayer book and read for me the prayers for a happy death. For a while, he seemed to be resting. Then slowly he awoke, smiling. He said clearly, Goodbye, Papa. Goodbye, Papa. Goodbye, Mom. Goodbye, Mama. Oh, what a beautiful sight I see. With these words, a smile on his lips, Dominic breathed his last. According to the testimony of Charles Savio, Dominic's father, shortly after his death, Dominic appeared to him. After verifying it was his son, Charles said, Oh, my dear boy, how wonderful you look. I don't know what to say. Are you in heaven? Yes, Papa, I am in heaven. Will you pray for us, for, my mother, for your mother and me? Yes, I will pray for you. With that vision, with that, the vision ended. On December 6, 1876, 19 years after his death, Dominic appeared to John Bosco. Dominic came to him to encourage him to advise John Bosco about the future of his work for the youth. In that vision, Don Bosco asked his student, Dominic, what gave you the most comfort at the hour of death? This is, Dom, this is John Bosco asking him, what gave you comfort at the moment of death? He said, what comforted me most at the point of death was the assistance of the powerful and loving mother of God. You guys, Mary, Mary is, is, is our lawyer. She's our advocate. And every time we pray the Hail Mary, this is in the secret of the rosary book, it says that every time we say the Hail Mary, Mary, she picks a rose from heaven, a grace from heaven, and every time we pray, she gathers them in her mantle. And that when we die, at the moment of our death, she stands next to your bedside, and she presents those roses to Jesus, and she pleads for you. She pleads for you to go to heaven. Like, what else could we want, right? What else could we want? And so, my brothers and sisters, we sometimes say the Mary, the Hail Mary so fleetingly. Hail Mary, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We don't realize what kind of grace we're gaining in that moment when we say the Hail Mary. What power there is in the Hail Mary. That Mary, when we say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for me at the hour of our death. What we're saying is, Mary, come to me at the hour of my death and plead for me. Such a powerful prayer that sometimes we just kind of overlook and we say so fast. On March 5th, 1950, Pope Pius XII beatified Dominic Savio. On June 12th, 1954, Pope Pius XII canonized Dominic Savio, this 14-year-old boy from Dominic, from Don Bosco's oratory. He was practically 15 years old, actually. In 1877, a lady from Turin accompanied her daughter of 10 years, Josephine, who had been paralyzed and mute by mouth, to see John Bosco. It happened uh, on the eve of the Feast of Mary, help of Christians. In the antechamber of St. Bosco, there were a lot of people, including congressmen, Earl Charles of Galetta, who was thinking about becoming a Salesian. Everyone agreed to give priority to the unfortunate girl. The mother met John Bosco uh, and told the painful story and asked for a blessing for Josephine. The saint imparted a blessing to the little sick girl and invited her to make the sign of the cross. The girl did, but with the left hand, which was not paralyzed. Now with the left. Not with the left, but with the right, he says. And repeated the invitation, the girl raised her paralyzed arm and made the sign of the cross as if her arm had not been paralyzed. Well, said John Bosco, but you have to say these words as I do. The girl, mute for a mouth, moved her tongue and repeated the sign of the cross and accompanied accompanied by the words. She shouted, Our Lady healed me. In confirmation of the miraculous heal healing, the girl walked perfectly and quickly in front of Don Bosco and the guests. 
The count who witnessed the miraculous event saw it as a sure sign for his Salesian vocation. How are we doing on time? Okay. Are we okay? Can I keep going? We have like maybe four or five slides left. We, we, do, we good? Okay. All right. So John Bosco, among his 40 dreams, was probably the most difficult. He has a dream of hell. And it's long. It's a really, really, really long account. And I highly suggest, not to scare you, but to scare you, <laughs> to read this account because he gives detail, a crazy detail account of what he saw and why and who goes to hell. Y'all want to go to hell? I do not want to go to hell. <laughs> I, I mean, just reading this today, like, put a, a, a holy fear. We need to have a holy fear in our hearts. Not a fear of just of hell, but a fear of losing heaven. Losing heaven. And he says, and I didn't put it in this part, but he says, and, and all of the saints say that the, the, there, there are levels of hell, and the worst level of hell is not the torments of the demons, which there is torments of demons. They torment you. They torture you for all of eternity. It does not stop. That the worst part, the darkest part of hell, is you feeling this desire to want to say the name of Jesus, to want to pray, to want to feel God's presence, but you cannot. You are completely cut off from God. That is the worst part of hell. With that, I'll carry along. <laughs> On Sunday night, May 3rd, 1868, he says, In my dream, a man who had appeared to me in the previous night, standing by my bed, he said to me, Get up and follow me. For heaven's sake, I, pro I protested, leave me in peace. I am exhausted. He led me to a vast, boundless plain, veritably a lifeless desert with not a soul in sight nor a tree or brook. Yellowed, dried up vegetation and added sadness to the desolate scene. I had no idea where I, where I was or what I was to do. At the beginning, the, pain, the path of sin is lined with roses. We took the road. It was beautiful, wide and neatly paved, both sides were lined with the magnificent verdant hedges covered with gorgeous flowers. I became aware that the oratory boys and a multitude of others whom I did not know were following me on the same road and began to fall and be pulled down into a crack in the ground. Carefully examining many of the traps, I saw that each bore an, an inscription, pride, disobedience, envy, the sixth commandment, theft, gluttony, sloth, anger, and so on. I want to stop here. So it begins as a beautiful path with roses. And he says, this is how sin always looks. The path to hell looks great. It's appealing. It's fun. It feels good. And it feels real. And so this, my brothers and sisters, is why so many people, and Jesus says it himself, that the road to hell is so wide and so many people are taking it because it's fun and it feels good. And it's easy. The road to heaven, on the other hand, is difficult. It can be difficult. And so we have to realize that the devil is going to use those very things that appear like roses to you to constantly draw you in. And he knows what they are. And he knows how to create that beautiful path for you. And before you know it, you're on that path and you don't even realize that you're on that path. And it can be very scary. He says, stepping back, into, uh, back a bit to see which ones, which of the boys, got trapped, the greater number of the boys, I discovered that the most dangerous were those of impurity. So the, the boys that were falling into the trap of the devil were ones who were falling into the sins of impurity, lust, disobedience, and pride. There were also two swords, okay, swords, or I guess you could say weapons to fight against hell or evil, one, one representing devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, especially through frequent Holy Communion, and the other devotion to the Blessed Virgin. There was also a hammer symbolizing confession and other knives symbolizing devotion to St. Joseph. How many of us are just barely making it to Sunday Mass? 
I want to encourage you. It says, frequent communion. I want to encourage you. Challenge yourself. Try to go to daily Mass at least twice a week. Or at least once a week aside from your Sunday Mass. I know so many people who began to do that and their life began to change. I mean, the, the, the struggles of, 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 of the difficulties that they were going through, the temptations, began to subside. Depression, anxiety, addictions began to subside. I have a friend who was stuck in a crazy, crazy, crazy life of sin. And her spiritual director told her, go to, go to daily mass and go to daily uh, adoration. Daily mass, daily, daily adoration. Within months, everything from her former life, completely, like a snap of a finger, you guys, stopped. Stopped. The torments of hell last forever, he says. May I mention that all these things, and, and then he says to this escort who took him to hell, which is an angel, he says, may I mention all of these things to my boys? I ask looking at him straight in the eyes. Yes, you may tell them whatever you remember. What advice shall I give them to safeguard them from such misfortune? You must insist that obedience to God, the church, and their parents and superiors, even in small things, will save them. I found myself sitting on my bed. My hand was, was stinging. This is when he woke up. I found myself sitting on my bed. My hand was stinging, and I kept rub rubbing it to ease the pain. As daylight came, I noticed that it was actually swollen. That dream and the oppression that that fire had affected me so much that the skin of my palm had been peeled off. <sighs> Yikes. This is continuing. I thought I would... Can I keep going? Yeah? Okay. He says, If so many of our boys end up this way, we are working in vain. How can we, we prevent such tragedies? My guide replied, This is their present state, and that is where they would go if they, would, if they were to die now. And then he says, Then let me doubt, jot down their names so that I may warn them and put them back on the path of heaven. Which is what I would do too. He says, do you, this is the angel, he says, do you really believe that some of them would reform if you were to warn them? At first, your warning might impress them, but soon they will forget it and say, oh, it was just a dream, and they will do worse things than before. Others, realizing that they had been unmasked, will receive the sacraments, but this will neither be spontaneous nor meritorious, since they are not upright. Others will go to confession because of a momentary fear of hell, but will be attached to still to sin. Then, then there is no way to save these misfortune lads, he says. Please advise me how they can be saved. Here is the advice. They have superiors. Let them obey them. They have rules. Let them observe them. They have the sacraments. Let them receive them. So a 15-year-old boy in Turin, Italy, was about to die. He called for Don Bosco, but the saint was not able to make it in time. Another priest heard the boy's confession, and the boy died. When Don Bosco returned to Turin, he set out at once to see the boy. When they told him that the boy was dead, he said, Just a misunderstanding. <laughs> After a moment of prayer in the room of the dead child, Don Bosco suddenly cried out, Charles, rise! To the utter amazement of all present, the boy stirred, opened his eyes, and sat up. Seeing Don Bosco, his eyes lit up. Father, I should now be in hell, gasped the boy. Two weeks ago, I was with a bad friend who led me into sin, and at my last confession, I was afraid to tell him everything. Oh, I've just come out of a horrible dream. I dreamt I was standing at the edge of a horrible pit of flames, surrounded by a horde of devils. They were about to throw me into the flames when a beautiful lady appeared and stopped them. There's still hope for you, Charles, she told me. Yet, you have not yet been judged, she says. At that moment, I heard you calling me. Oh, Don Bosco, what a joy it is to see you again. Will you please hear my confession? After hearing the boy's confession, Don Bosco said to the boy, Charles, now the gates of heaven lie wide open for you. Would you rather stay here with us or would you rather go? The boy looked away for a moment, and his eyes grew moist with tears. And an expectant hush fell over the room. Don Bosco, he said, I'd rather go to heaven. 
The mourners watched in amazement as, as Charles leaned back on the pillows, closed his eyes, and settled once more into the stillness of death. <laughs> Isn't this guy amazing? He is unbelievable. This is a, this is a beautiful lesson for us to really take confession serious. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is to really prepare ourselves when we go to confession to have a good examination of conscience. Oftentimes when we go to confession, I mean, of course, this is a different thing. If you forget on accident, of course, you forget. It's different. And then if you remember later on, you have to have faith that Christ forgives your sin because you intended to say it. However, sometimes when we go to confession, we're so afraid that we try... I mean, some of us really hold back the sin, which is, makes your confession actually invalid. But some of us don't necessarily hold back our sin, but we water it down by giving excuses and, and trying to come up with stories and trying to explain ourselves so much because we're so ashamed of what we've done that it hurts us to even face what we've done. So what we need to do is we need to flat out say what we did. We need to accuse ourselves flat out. This is what I did. I committed the sin of lust. I committed the sin of whatever it is. I stole. Not like, Abuna, you know, we, the, you know when we were at the, the, I love this one. We were at the uh, grocery store, and, um, and you know, it, uh, when I was scanning, one of them didn't get scanned, and I didn't rescan it, so I just, I just put it in the bag. No, just say you stole. Flat out. You stole. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that, did she steal? Okay, you stole. But do you see how kind of impure our confession can be when we talk like that, when we act like that? Like, how sorry are we really? I mean, and I'm not dogging this person at all, and I'm not dogging any person. Like, listen, like, we all, I do this even in confession. Sometimes I want to find explanations and try to, like, make it look better than it really is. But the reality is, is that that's because there's a lack of sorrow for our sin. We're still worried about ourselves, we're not worried about God. We're still consumed with ourselves, we're not consumed with God. Right. After all of that, he says this, Sanctity is easy, he would say. He told his Salesians and the young people that God wants us to be happy and to rejoice in the love of Jesus. Just do your duty in school, at home, at work, the best you can. Offer your life to God. The happy times and the sad are challenging things. Life sends so many opportunities to join in the sufferings of Jesus. Bad weather, disappointments, physical illness, sorrow, these will make you saints. So simple, right? It's the simple things. It's the simple things throughout our day. The God is saying to you, do you want to be a saint? Do you want to be a saint today? Because every single day is a brand new sheet that God is, it's a brand new canvas that God is saying to you, today I want to make you a saint. Be prepared for every little thing that is going to come your way because every little thing I intend purposely to make you a saint. I allow it purposely all to make you a saint. Also that you can recognize me in that moment. Those are actually real. I hope you guys have been paying attention to the pictures. I meant to point it out. But these are real photographs of John Bosco. Really cool. So one time he bilocated. Which means that he was in two places at one time. Okay. Um, okay. We just have these two left. Are we good? Can I keep going? Okay. All right. Sabah al khair. Are you guys sleeping? No? Okay. Good. <laughs> I can do this all day long because I just, I can listen to these people all day long. Like, do you feel that way? Right? Like, I mean, you guys are all still here, which is a good thing. Okay? Good. 1886, when he was in Turin, Italy, uh, Father Branda was at the Salesian College of Saria in Spain. Um, so this, actually, that's a, that's a typo. So this priest, Father Branda, is in the Salesian College in Spain. The college, unfortunately, contained some dangerous and scandalous boys who were hypocritically, uh, hypocritically pretending to be upright students. They were in reality plotting a serious crime. January 28th or 29th, Father Brando was sound asleep when he heard the voice of Don Bosco calling him by name and instructing him to get up and follow him. 
Father Brando went back to sleep after he decided it must have been a dream, since he knew that Father Bosco was in Italy. A week later, during the night of February 5th to the 6th, he again heard the voice of Don Bosco and saw him standing at the foot of his bed. Shoot, I would have ran out of my room. Anyway, Father Brando got up quickly, dressed and approached the saint and kissed his hand as a sign of respect. The saint said to him, your house is going well. I am pleased with you, but there is one dark spot. Suddenly, Father Brando saw an apparition of four young men, two of whom he recognized as boarders of the house and two as students. With a look of anger and severity, Don Bosco pointed at one of the apparitions and said, tell this one to be more prudent. As for the others, they must be expelled. Show them no pity and do it as soon as possible. He decided to wait. When he woke up, he decided to wait. But within a few days, he received a letter from Turin written by Father Rua, which stated, I was walking with Don Bosco today under the uh, porticos of the oratory, and he bade me ask you whether you had carried out the order he had himself intimidated you, a, he, he intimidated you to do a short time ago. So this is a priest writing him a letter saying to him, John Bosco asked me, did you do what I told you? We got that so far? Okay. In spite of this, Father Brandon decided to wait a day or two. But then, one morning, he was about to start Holy Mass, and he reported, while I was at the foot of the altar, I felt in my inmost, innermost being an imperious voice murmuring, if you fail to carry out the order, this is your last Mass. After Holy Mass, Father Brandon called for the boys. Strange to say, during the interrogation, each of them unwittingly assumed the attitude in which he had appeared as an apparition on the night of February 6th. The three were sum summar summarily expelled. The, I think that there's, there's so much here, aside from the fact that he was able to appear to him and be in two places at once, is, is amazing, right? But I think it's important for us to realize how obedience is so powerful. Obedience goes and it, and it challenges the very, very root of our struggle, which is pride which is wanting to be our own God. And I don't think we're willing to kind of, kind of do battle with ourselves. When something is forbidden, and God has made it very clear to you, do not do this or do this, do it. We need to do it. Even if that means that I have to do, I have to hurt myself, and it, because it does hurt. Let me tell you, it hurts. It hurts to, to, to be obedient to God and what he's asking of you, even when it doesn't seem like something that you want to do or something that seems very difficult or even something that seems that, like is going to be painful for you, do it. Do it. It hurts. But in the end, that pain is nothing in comparison to the pain that will befall us if we don't listen to God's commands. And oftentimes, we have to learn that the hard way. Lots of trial and error. And that's okay. God is very patient with us. The last years were difficult for him. He was, an old, he was old and tired, but he kept up with all the activities of his Salesians, inspiring them to greater achieve, achievements for the youth. But when he took to his bed in December of 1887, he said, Now I go to my rest. I shall not again get up. Just before his death, he summoned his sons and begged the favor of their prayers. Do not ever forget these three things. Devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, devotion to Mary, help of Christians, and devotion to always be in support and come to the defense of the Holy Father. On January 31st, 1888, age 72, Don Bosco, wore out, worn out, bold, bought in his body, finally yielded to nature. With the names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph on his lips, he said, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, assist me in my last agony. Jesus, and Mary, and Joseph, may my soul expire in peace with you. Don Bosco's soul passed to his God and his lady at the morning Angelus bell. So do you guys know what the Angelus is? It's um, in Chaldean, we say, Malachim Mariam Boshera Mat Mariam, or the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit, and then you say, Hail Mary. And there's three of them. There are three, uh, three Hail Marys in that prayer. And usually we do that prayer at 6, noon, 6, 
Um, so, or uh, six, um, nine, 12, every three hours, actually. And so he died right as the, the church bells were ringing and they were praying the Angelus. Don Bosco so fled and uh, the people of Turin said, our saint has left us. At the time of Don Bosco's death in 1888, there were 250 homes for boys founded by the Salesian Society containing 130,000 children. Of these, over 6,000 became priests. The Salesian Society still exists today and is the second largest religious order in the world, continuing St. John Bosco's mission of helping and educating poor and disenfranchised youth. So, uh, miracles of his canonization, a few months after his death, Don Bosco applied over the disease, uh, diseased eye a piece of cloth. Uh, I'm sorry, after a few months of Don Bosco's death, uh, this man, Don Giuseppe, applied over his diseased eyes a piece of cloth which had belonged to the saint, saying, Oh, Father Don Bosco, I firmly believe that you are in heaven, and you can make my illness vanish. In an instant, he was cured narrating the fact that he said plainly, if this was not a miracle, I do not know what is. Mary Constantine, sister of charity in the diocese of Besancon in France, uh, had been seriously ill for eight months with an internal ulcer in her stomach, vomiting blood, forcing her to be fed on milk alone. And on the eighth day of the novena to the servant of God, Don Bosco, she was suddenly healed. She got up from the bed, ate with the sisters, and returned to her work in the kitchen. And in the aftermath, she went on pilgrimage to a chapel on a hill nearby. On April 1st, 1934, uh, Pope, uh, Pope Pius IX proclaimed that John Bosco a saint. He had been declared blessed on uh, January, June 2nd, 1929, to the glory of God, the church, and on Easter, um, yeah, we already said that. I'm a mess. I, um, I want to give you guys a second, um, just uh, as we always do. Of course, we will be blessed, and unfortunately, we can't have physical touch with the relics today. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, God doesn't need us to touch. God needs our faith. Right? And that's how we ultimately touch God. We touch God not by physically always touching, but by touching him with faith. And so uh, I'm going to give us a second to just pray about uh, some intentions that you might have, people that might be sick, uh, mental illnesses, physical illnesses, anything that you might have going on. Uh, and we are going to ask for the intercession of John Bosco and Dominic Savio to come to our aid uh, and to inspire us with a great love for God and Our Lady, uh, as we heard today, and also a greater attention to the youth, to the children around us. So sometimes we can just so quickly over, overlook, but really they need our desperate care. And so we ask them to give us that sensitive heart, um, to especially the, to the most vulnerable around us, not just the children. Amen? Amen? So give us a second to just pray for our intentions. Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you with great faith, faith that has been inflamed by the example of St. John Bosco and St. Dominic Savio. We come, Lord Jesus, with their example, with their virtues, with their prayers, and Lord, we beg and we ask and we trust, and we know, Lord, that you are the divine physician. And so, Jesus, anything in our hearts and our minds, anything from our childhood, anything from our past, pains, abuses, anything that might have happened to us or still happening to us or to the ones that we love, any physical illnesses, headaches, cancers, any type of physical illness or illnesses or ailments, in the name and by the blood of Jesus Christ, the intercession of St. John Bosco and St. Dominic Savio, we command that all of these illnesses to be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. Come Holy Spirit. Where there is pain, Jesus, where there is illness, bring your healing touch, Jesus. Please, St. John Bosco and St. Dominic Savio, we trust in your prayers and in your example. We believe 
we trust and we know that the Lord has raised you as an example to strengthen our faith. So in this moment, we ask for your support to strengthen our faith. That with our faith, we would touch the heart of God and we would gain a unity with God, even here on earth. So that whether or not we are physically healed, whether or not we experience what we are asking for, that we would cling to Jesus, that we would never turn away, that we would never allow our difficulties or our past to keep us away from Jesus, but to always run to Jesus. To run to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, to run to the Blessed Virgin Mary, to run to St. Joseph. Please, St. John Bosco and St. Dominic Savio, pray for us and grant us these many, many, many graces that we pray with confidence. In the name and by the blood of Jesus Christ through their prayers, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, forever. Amen. Amen. So next week, uh, are you guys excited for next week? I'm already excited for next week. Next week, we will be talking about St. Andre Bessette. Do you guys know who St. Andre Bessette is? Raise your hand if you know who St. Andre Bessette is. Okay, so how many of you guys have heard of like, you know, when your moms or like our boater parents, they go to Qadishta Hanne, you know, they go to like, they go to Montreal or they go to Quebec uh, during the summer. So they go usually to a church uh, that is called the Oratory of St. Joseph. It is the largest church dedicated to St. Joseph in the whole entire world. And it was built by St. Andre Bessette. And so we're going to learn about this humble doorkeeper. He was a porter. Very, very, very similar to, uh, to uh, Blessed Solanus Casey. But incredible saint, you guys. And he's going to teach us how to have a very strong devotion to St. Joseph, among many, many other lessons. So please come out next week as we learn about the life and uh, great devotion to St. Joseph with St. Andre Bissette. See you guys next week. Next week. God bless you all. Have a safe night.